Hello, my friends. Welcome to Worship at Bread of Life, Deaf Lutheran Church. We are located in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we are grateful that you have joined us today for worship. The people you will see today on screen are um, here right now, and I am Michelle Lewis. I'm the pastor at Bread of Life, Deaf Lutheran Church. Hi, my name is Dorothy Sparks. I'm a deacon here at Bread of Life. Hi, I'm David Evans. I'm the ASL interpreter. As we begin worship, we remember that God is the one who gathers us. We are not here by accident. Instead, we proclaim that God is acting in our lives and gathers us together. As we gather, we light a candle to remember that we are not alone. And you are all invited to light a candle in your home, again, to remember that we are united, we are drawn together in the light of Christ. And we are now in the season that is called Pentecost, the time of the church year, when we celebrate and remember that the Holy Spirit comes to us and is with us, is comforting and encouraging us and also challenging us to be the body and the hands and the feet, the words, the essence of Jesus Christ in the world. That's what the Holy Spirit does, calls to us, invites us, comforts, challenges us and um, walks with us. And at this particular time, this particular year, our lives really feel upside down. They really feel unknown. And so we do draw to one another and we give thanks that we can remember we are drawn together by God. And we also um, use this light to remember. To remember God with us, but also to remember people who have died before us. And in particular, we remember George Floyd. We remember that the light of his life went out because of injustice. And so at this time, we pray that this candlelight will draw us closer to God's Holy Spirit that spirit of God will give us life that will call us to act in a way that honors all life. And in particular, in ways that honor black lives. That we would each, each one of us would address and confront injustice where we encounter it. So at this time, I invite you to light the candles you have in your homes. Thank you. 
invite you to focus on the flames of the candle, the candle here or the candle in your home, to take some deep and calming breaths that let your body draw closer to God as we enter into worship together. Today we have an opening litany that is based on Psalm chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. We love you, Lord. And so here we are today to say... Where have you gone? Why are you absent? Hello, God, look this way. Show your face. Please stop hiding from us. How long, Lord, will you turn away? How long will you forget we exist? Some days it feels like forever. I can hardly breathe, Lord. We're missing you in this world of suffering and grief. We love you, Lord, and so we gather up our courage to say this. How long will you let discouragement and doubt win? How long will you let hatred ruin our days? How long will you let fear rule all of the earth? Come, Holy Spirit, heal us, teach us, lead us, restore us. We need you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, move swirl and dance among us. Remind us that you are always present, encouraging us, drawing us in and inspiring us to be the loving people you created us to be. Stir us during this time together to walk humbly embrace love and do justice in this unjust and broken world. Amen. 
As we've done in our normal online worship experiences, um, I want to just give you a little bit of context, a little bit of background before we have the Bible lesson. Um, and that it just helps us to know kind of what's going on in this Bible lesson. And then we'll have the sermon after uh, the Bible lesson. So just to let you know, uh, for the next four weeks, we'll be staying in the book of Acts. Um, and we're learning about how the church began to grow after Pentecost. Uh, so this book is called the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really more appropriate name would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, because throughout Acts, we get stories about uh, making sense of how the Holy Spirit is working in the world. How the Holy Spirit calls the church to embody or become the body, the hands and feet of Christ who is risen from the dead. So this means that the church, you and me together, for better or for worse, uh, the church becomes the presence of Christ in the world now. So what does that mean? A good example of that might be looking at what Holy Trinity Lutheran is doing this week, last week, since... Um, Memorial Day, which is being with their neighbors in their need. They've collected, oh, so much food. The tables are overflowing with food, diapers, uh, toilet paper. They've been collecting plywood to cover up windows for businesses that were um, threatened by the riots. that church, Holy Trinity, that Bread of Life folks are familiar with, is staying in the neighborhood. They're showing up and taking care of their neighbors. Being the body of Jesus Christ right now where it's needed. So this, the book of Acts really is a bunch of stories about churches like Holy Trinity, that are that are, are being Jesus in the world. Sometimes we read them and it feels like impossible to believe. And really, as we look at what Holy Trinity is doing right now, it sort of feels impossible to believe that they're able to do that. So... Often I think we look at these biblical stories and go, well, maybe someone really stretched the truth. I don't know if that really happened. And maybe it didn't happen exactly as it's stated. But as we can see with Holy Trinity, the people of those churches in the book of Acts respond they respond when the Holy Spirit calls them to do work with, the, with God. That's what it means. The church is the body of Christ in the world now. Uh, just a couple other things, background about Acts, and then we'll get into the story for today. Uh, Acts is written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And the book is designed to be a proclamation of what has happened. It's a teaching for us who are believers. It's written at least in part, to encourage us believers to keep the faith. Because 
uh, in the world now as the world 2,000 years ago, we believers need to be encouraged. We believe something that goes counter to the world. Our societies look at us and think you're a little bit crazy to believe that story. And so we need to be encouraged. Because faith gets tested. Faith is hard to hold on to. Sometimes our faith is tested by things that happen outside of the church in opposition to what we believe. And sometimes our faith is tested by the fighting that we do inside the church when we argue and go back and forth with each other in our churches. So there are lots of reasons why we believers need to be encouraged. Encouraged to continue to believe. Encouraged to look for and notice the Holy Spirit moving, breathing, blowing all over our beautiful world. And so with those few comments, I asked Dorothy to share the Bible lesson for today. Our lesson today is from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 16, or 1 through Peter and John were going to the temple at three o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. Meanwhile, a man, crippled since birth, was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate known as the beautiful gate so that he could beg for money for those from those entering the temple. When Peter and John were about to enter, he asked them for a gift. Peter and John stared at him. Peter said, look at us. The man gazed at them expecting to receive something. Peter said, I don't have any money but I will give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. And he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. At once, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the one who used to sit at the temple's beautiful gate, asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprise at what had happened to him. My friends, grace and peace be with you in these difficult and challenging days. Amen. Well, this is not an easy sermon to uh, share, nor was it an easy week of preparations. Um, my colleagues here uh, in worship both live near where the riots were happening last week. The neighborhood where Bread of Life has its building is all sorts of torn up. There's so much destruction. Our hearts 
are breaking. And on top of that, or in addition to that, uh, George Floyd was murdered by police officers, the police who are called to protect and to serve. And on top of that, we have a global pandemic that says we need to keep physical distance from one another to slow down the spread of this virus. And we're discovering again that racism is underneath all kinds of structures in our society. And in fact, that racism, it's not just in like the systems and the structures, not just in our schools and the courts and those kinds of things, but it's in us. that we ourselves have racism in us. That there's so much negative assumption about people who have black and brown and indigenous colored skin. We see their skin color and assume all kinds of things about them. We don't even really realize we're doing it. The racism that founded, really was part of the founding of our country, that's in us. And that racism is like a sense that people are fundamentally different from one another based on their skin color. And the United States has a history that is built on this belief. And what that means for us today, here and now is that we have laws and systems like the police or the court systems or the ways that we buy and sell homes, neighborhoods where we maybe can or cannot live depending on our skin color, our school systems, all these systems and many, many more prefer people who have light colored skin And all of those systems we have grown up with, we have been part of, they have benefited those of us who have light colored skin. And it means then that we're influenced by those systems and that we have preferences and bias for other people with light colored skin. Maybe we don't recognize those preferences, but we have them. Now I know often 
often when we start to discuss racism, the fact that racism is a part of every system in our country, we feel defensive. We say, I don't want that. I don't want, I don't judge people based on their skin color. I didn't, I didn't make up the rules. I don't believe in that. We often feel very defensive. And so when we feel those way, that way, when we start to feel, look, I didn't do it, don't blame me. It's not my fault. That, that gives us information about ourselves. Because it, it doesn't feel good when we feel judged. Whether we are judging ourselves or someone else is judging us, it never ever feels good. It doesn't feel good. It does not feel good when we realize that we've been wrong and we feel convicted or feel like we're guilty of bad behavior doesn't feel good. And so we get defensive because we really would like to cover up that feeling. We don't want to feel bad about ourselves. We don't want to feel like the benefits that we have hurt others. So we try to cover up that feeling and we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to understand it. We just really want it to go away. And at this moment in time, many moments in time, but at this particular moment in time in Minneapolis, in the Twin Cities, in Minnesota, the black and brown and indigenous communities are inviting us to do something different. They're asking us to sit with those feelings. It's not comfortable. It's not fun. <laughs> But they're asking us to sit with those feelings. To wonder about those feelings. To learn more history of our country, of our state, of our cities and history of our neighborhoods. Our friends and siblings who are black and brown and from indigenous communities, they're asking us to focus on their stories And as much as it feels uncomfortable for us to feel all of the emotions that come up in those stories, they're asking us to focus on that. We don't live it. Our day-to-day -day experience doesn't include their experience. And so they're asking us to focus on their stories. And to start to recognize how the color of their skin affects how you and I see them, how we understand their behaviors through a lens of racism.
prejudice. Because even if we don't realize we're doing this, we are doing it. We are judging. Um, in particular, we judge black boys. Research has shown that people who have light colored skin tend to believe that black boys are much older than they really are. So if we believe that a 10 year old black boy is really 15, we will watch his behaviors and expect something that's not possible from him. Because a 10 year old is very, very different than a 15 year old. And if we think that a 10 year old boy is 15, and he's running around making all kinds of noise, doing crazy 10 year old things. We're gonna, we're gonna say that 15 year old, look at what he's doing, he is so naughty. And we're probably gonna call the police. Another example of how um, the color of skin affects what we as light skinned people do is that we've set up laws that create harder penalties for people with black skin than for people with white skin. And one example of this is the um, sentencing rules for people who use cocaine, which is an illegal drug. So there are two different kinds of cocaine primarily that showed up in the 90s. One was powdered cocaine, and the other was called rock cocaine or crystal. Both are the same drug. In fact, powdered cocaine is more processed, but they're the same thing. And the laws for how do you decide how much jail time someone would have if they were found to have cocaine on them depended on the kind of cocaine they had. So powdered cocaine got significantly lower sentencing compared to rock cocaine. Now, overall, white people tend to use powdered cocaine. And black people tended to be the ones who would use rock cocaine. It means then that any black people who used cocaine ended up in jail for significantly more time than people the white folks who tended to use powder cocaine. Now, it doesn't matter, I think, it doesn't matter what we think about people using illegal drugs. The point is, if you're using illegal drugs, the same drug, it should be the same problem, same penalty. But because we are influenced by this idea that skin color makes us different, we set up different rules depending on color of skin. And that turns into people's experience in life. So a friend of a friend shared some experiences from her own life. She is a black woman. She grew up in Iowa. 
And she shared a few memories of what happens to her on a pretty regular basis. So she remembered one experience when she was one year old. She's a little baby in a stroller. She was one. She was out shopping with her white-skinned sister. And a man spit on her face. She was sitting in a stroller and a man spit on her. She was one. She had another memory from when she was 10. And during fifth grade, they were studying slavery. And part of what they were doing is they had a slave auction. She's the only girl, only person in the class who is not white. So she said, I don't want to be auctioned as a slave. The teacher responded. She said, then you could be a slave owner. The girl said, I don't want to be a slave owner either. And the teacher said, either you participate in this or you fail fifth grade social studies. This little girl, 10 years old, had to auction her classmates off based on their size, their weight, their strength, their intelligence, all the things that they did to sell people in the slave markets 400, 300 years ago. In this girl, she wrote, I cry. That was in 2002. She wrote a couple other memories. In 2008, she was 17. She said, I received a good score on my ACT, my test to get into college. She said, my friends and I are sharing the scores that we got. And her friends don't believe her. She said, I showed a picture of the scorecard. And then she said, I, I am told they add extra points to people who mark African American for their race because otherwise, none of them could get into college. That was in 2008. One more from 2018 when she was 26. She said, my white sister and I walk into a gas station. There were three men and two women in the gas station. 
when they walked in, all conversation stopped. There's at least one man with a hat that says, make America great again. All eyes are on me. I want to leave. My sister refuses. And she says, I have just a, as much right to be here as they do. So she picks a drink and goes to pay for it. I am glued to her side. Everyone is still staring at me. We leave. The station was silent the whole time. It is a consequence of sin in our country, in our state, in our cities, our towns, that we see one another through different eyes. We look at one another with judgment. In particular, we look at people who have black skin, people who have brown skin, people who are from indigenous communities, and we see them with judgment. And we want to follow Christ. We want to be good, faithful Christians. So we ask, what can we do? How can we help? What can we do? Because we don't want to feel helpless and unsure. We want to make things better. And we really, really do not want to admit that we have done something wrong. We don't want to feel guilty because we benefit when others are hurting. And I, we don't want to be in a situation where we benefit because someone else is hurting. And we wonder, what can we do? And I think perhaps we can start with what Peter and John did in the Bible lesson today. As they were getting to the temple and they encountered this man who looked like he needed something from them, and he did. He needed help. But Peter and John didn't start from the point of thinking they knew what that man needed. Instead, they looked at him. They looked at him, and they said, you can look at us. You don't need to be ashamed. Look at us. They stopped. They paid attention. They listened. And they responded. 
they were with this man. They were with him, waiting to learn what he needed. And in fact, receiving a gift from him. So, like Peter and John, we can start with more learning. We can start to look and see people, not just black and brown and lazy and drug addicted and scary. No, we can look and see people, children of God. We can start to look at ourselves and notice our feelings about others who look different from us. And we can help our neighbors in their moments of need. And we can start perhaps with bringing some food or diapers or toilet paper or a broom and some garbage bags. We can bring those things to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. They are in the midst of the damage and they are providing services and supplies to their neighborhood. Maybe you're able to volunteer. Maybe you're able to make a donation. We can do that and, and we can learn, we can listen, and we can believe the stories and experiences that our black and brown and indigenous brothers and sisters are experiencing. It's not easy and it won't happen quickly. Won't, our society won't magically be corrected and healed. We have to be um, persevere. And I believe that this community here at Bread of Life, you have unique experience to connect with or relate to these experiences that our black and brown siblings are telling us about. It's not the same, but you can relate. You can, you know the feeling of being judged as soon as someone discovers you're deaf. So again, it's not an easy message. It's not an easy time. And there's, that's the truth. We just have to keep taking one step at a time together. We can't take shortcuts.
instead we walk together as a community learning to trust one another learning to trust more people to give us information to teach us so that we begin to recognize how racism influences us it, it affects us every day and still god promises through the power of the holy spirit to come to work with us to work in us to shape us, to be with us, to comfort us, and to challenge us in our lives. So if you have questions or comments or want to have more conversation about this, please contact me. I know it's not an easy conversation, but it's not one that we can pretend doesn't need to happen. So God be with you in this next week. Prayer for Racial Justice. Save us, O oh God, from ourselves. When we fear to confess, from racism covered up with nice words. from the lies of white supremacy that are hidden from microaggressions thinly veiled in arrogance. from apologies when they don't give way to action. From forgiveness without facing the truth. from reconciliation without reparations. Deliver us, O oh God, when we expect our siblings of color to keep doing our emotional work. We are grateful for the long arc that bends toward justice. We pray, grant us wisdom. Give us courage for facing of these days. By the power of the spirit <clears throat> and for the sake of the kingdom that we share in Christ Jesus. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. At this time. Oh. Oh. Yeah, so I'm going to back up just a minute and say 
peace be with you. At this time, uh, invite everybody to share the peace because we're still living in days of pandemic. We're all at our homes. So take your phones and text or send an email or write a note, send a card to share the peace with one another because it's so important, especially now when our cities are so upset and there's so much unrest happening that we need to check in with one another. We need to say, how are you? How are you? And know that God's peace is with each person. And now we will receive the offering. So I'll just add to please prepare your offerings to send to Bread of Life. I know we're still not in the building and it could be quite some time before we're at Bread of Life in person, but we're still doing the work that God calls us to do. Our online worship is a way for us to be together gathered together by God, and it is also a way for us to share the good news of God's love with deaf people and their families. You can email the information about our worship to anyone, and because we have it interpreted and voiced, our worship is accessible to anyone who knows English and knows sign language, or knows sign language. So. Please go ahead, send it, share it. And in this time, we ask that you prepare your offerings to send to Bread of Life. And with that, let us pray. Holy One creator, and Christ, and the Spirit, you have given yourself to us. Now we give back to you. Please say it with me. This money that seems so little, this worship that seems so small, these words that never quite get it right. Accept our offer. Transform it by the power of your spirit. Transform it to be enough money. Plenty of praise honest words to proclaim and enact your peace, your justice, and your love in the world. Last week on Sunday morning, our council met and approved to go ahead and serve communion in this online format because we don't know how long we'll be um, separated and not worshiping at Bread of Life. And so uh, the first Sunday and the third Sunday of each month, we will be sharing communion together. And so you're invited to bring to worship those weeks some bread or some crackers and some wine or juice. Do your best.
to bring something like what Jesus shared with his friends and followers. Because we are remembering that God provides for us in our need. That God takes care of our body and our spirit with these gifts. So don't bring a whole big, huge pile of food that you can't eat because you wouldn't normally do that. And it's a waste. We proclaim that with the word and with our faith and with these elements, somehow they are transformed into more than just bread and just wine. They nourish us and feed our spirit. So we come with reverence, we come with respect to this meal. We don't just quick grab the last piece of candy in the box or something like that. We bring something with reverence and respect. And then together in this online space, we will share the meal together. So uh, we'll go through the, the parts that we always go through for communion. And then when we get to serving that, um, the, the communion pieces, um, I will offer each the bread and the wine for you, but if you're serving others in your home, you can tell them this is the body of Christ given for you with the bread. And then with the wine or the juice, you can share with them, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And so with that, we enter into our time of the meal where we share the Lord's Supper together. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should everywhere and always give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You pour out the fire of your Holy Spirit and fulfill the promises of resurrection. You unite us in one body of people using every language from every place in the world. And so with Mary Magdalene, with Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection. With the earth and the sea and all the creatures who witnessed the resurrection. With the angels and archangels of cherubim and seraphim who witness the resurrection, we give thanks. And together we praise your name and join in their unending song.
on Jesus last night when he gathered to eat with his friends and followers. He was betrayed. And still, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. Thank God. Blessed it. And gave it for all to drink. Saying, this cup is the new agreement in my blood. My blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Come to the banquet. All is ready for you. Say it with me. Alleluia. So this bread and wine is offered for everyone. This is a gift that God gives to us so we know we are not alone. At Bread of Life, we are honored to share this meal with any who desire to receive it. So, this is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. We'll give you a couple of minutes to share the elements with one another. And then we'll go ahead with our closing prayers.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, kindle in us your holy fire. Give us confidence of your unfailing presence. May we turn to you for hope in times of uncertainty and loss. Comfort the families of George Floyd and so many other families of black people who have been killed in our country. Help us, Lord, to live as the body of Christ in the world. To be people who pray and learn, people who share life and love our neighbors, people who seek justice in all ways, people who worship and break bread and share good news and people who rest and grow in the Holy Spirit. God, please unite the world through our common prayers for peace and understanding and send us out with your love. Help us to depend on you so that your beloved community in this beautiful world would be restored and renewed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now the blessing that goes with us as we are sent out into the world. We're not scattered. It's not an accident where we go. God send us out to be the hands and the feet and the voice of God in the places where we live and work and go to school and teach and learn and all of those things that we do every day. God sends us out. So as you are sent, take this blessing with you. God's Holy Spirit is our advocate. Sent from God in Jesus Christ's name. And so now we pray that the Holy Spirit will teach you and remind you of Jesus' words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. May Christ's presence and the Holy Spirit's presence stay with you always. Amen. Jesus commands us. Come out. It changes our lives from dark caves of struggle to live into the brightness of new joy. Jesus cries, Come out. unbinds us from the chains of the past. Jesus invites us, come out. And invites us into a world where the Holy Spirit blows and breathes life, the life of God.
now. Go out into a world that needs the Spirit of God. Go out. We are God's resurrected people. We go out with God's holy breath. Amen.